Hi everyone and welcome back to the Handmade Bosses podcast. So, or rather I should say how to be a handmade boss podcast, <laughs> call it by its full name. Um, today I am joined by Vicky. Hi Vicky. Hi. And how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm warm, like I said. <laughs> and I feel yes. bad for people who are going to like listen to this in the winter months because they're probably like oh he yeah you remember what that felt like but at the moment it's it's an issue <laughs> yeah big issue at the moment for me <laughs> yes yeah we're going to get into that because I'd love to hear more about that and how you kind of cope with that but for now I would love for you to tell us a little bit about what you do plug away tell us everything <laughs> yeah so I'm Vicky. I am the owner of Rawson Chocolate, which is a an unroasted vegan chocolate company. So I make bean to bar chocolate. I get the beans imported from Peru and turn them into chocolate bars, chocolate bonbons, seasonal chocolates, and sell them to you lovely lot. So um mostly for gifting, but also for sort of corporate things. Things like after dinner chocolates, um, things for events, things for wedding favors. So quite a variety, really. Love that. <laughs> love that. Love that. And what made you fall in love? I'd, I'd love to ask specifically about the vegan side of things and the unroasted side of things. Like, tell us a little bit more about that. From someone who is a bit of a chocolate, I don't really know the the difference. I perhaps I should because it's one of my hobbies, but. <laughs> Yeah, I started doing the vegan chocolate um, after I had my twins. My twins are five now and, God, they're keeping me busy. But um, I found out that myself and my son, I've got boy-girl twins, my son had a dairy intolerance. And then, of course, feeding him was a problem because I couldn't eat anything that would make him ill. And I had just had twins and I needed chocolate desperate for it so it was a case of there were a lot of chocolates at the time that were starting to test the sort of vegan area but they were basically over sweetened using filler oils and palm oil which is obviously really bad for the environment and just not overly nice so as soon as I started to sleep again eventually (laughs) um I I started playing and making my own and had some horrible disasters. Um, but eventually people started to go, yeah, this actually tastes like chocolate. And it tasted like chocolate rather than tasting like vegan chocolate. So that was kind of my big win. And then I kind of started going, exploring down the ethical side of things a bit more, looking at where chocolate came from, looking at the farmers, um, looking at the environmental impact of it. And it's quite horrible, actually. You think of some of the big chocolate companies, there is a lot of deforestation going on. 80% of our chocolate comes from West Africa. And the way that the farmers and the environment is treated there is actually quite horrible. Um, They tend to cut everything down to just grow the one crop. Um, The farmers are paid an absolute pittance. And because of that, they can't afford to bring in the crop without employing their children. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of child labour involved. They can't afford to send them to school. So it's, it's just not the most nice thing to think about really when you 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 know your cheap snack off the shelf is actually costing somebody an awful lot so looking into that a little bit more I started exploring where it was happening the right way and there's a few amazing companies out there who do it the right way and finding little cooperatives little farmers unions um, and importers who were treating the farmers properly was kind of my little mission So I started looking into it and found this little consortium in um, Peru, in the Comito NA region, and started trading with them. And I get about 80% of my cacao from there now, and just started playing with it and exploring with it. And the unroasted side came in because the cacao was really, really good quality. One of the reasons, not the main reason, you roast the chocolate to get different flavour profiles, but one of the reasons, particularly with the cheaper beans, is to kind of hide the imperfections in the chocolate. So you roast away those imperfections. Whereas these beans are amazing. I think they're lovely. 
So I think keep the pure quality of the bean, keep the fruity flavour profiles going there and don't mess with it too much. Keeps more of the minerals in it, keeps more of the nutrients in it, and you end up with just a much, much nicer product at the end. So, and also saves me a step, saves me a job. So, (laughs) win-win there, really. (laughs) Oh, wow. I didn't didn't know that. So it's almost like when you roast the beans, you are doing so because the taste won't be great if you just skip that step. Yes, in some flavour pro sometimes it's done to enhance the flavour profile or to get a particular, you know, slightly more nutty, slightly more caramelised flavour out of it. But for your generic sort of chocolate bar on the shelf in Sainsbury's, it's probably done just to kind of hide a few of those imperfections in the quality. And that is done so often that, you know, finding a good quality bean, I want to sing about it and I want to shout about it and say, actually, I'm not having to do that because this is such good quality. Have it as it is, you know, it's great. So it's, yeah, it's finding that sort of balance. I love, I love that. So how long did it take you to find a place that was ethical, that was high quality like how long did that whole process take you quite a long time yes and um i mean to start off with i was doing what everybody does and buying in chocolate and melting it down and putting it in a pretty mold and yeah you will find a million shops like that on etsy and on all over the place um then i started to kind of experiment with the breed beans and Got them from a variety of places, but as I researched it a bit more, I was kind of like, oh, do I want to give my money to that sort of trade? I don't really want to do that. Um, And eventually you just, just from trial and error and talking to people, you just eventually find someone who shares your values and someone who you click with and someone you can work with. And yeah, it takes a long time, but When you get there, it's like, yes, I've done it. Um, And I'm just looking to kind of expand my reach a little bit more from, you know, I'm only one person at the moment, one tiny little um, shop, but the aim is to kind of expand and meet other farmers and talk to other little cooperatives and try different beans because they've all got their own unique flavours. Right. So I suppose it's a bit like coffee then in that respect. It really is. And there's starting to become a bit more of a movement into the chocolate world with people kind of having chocolate tastings and having events to kind of sample different flavours and so on. It's it's still a little bit unknown compared to coffee or wine or that sort of thing. But I think the problem is people are so used to going and buying a Mars bar off the shelf for pound fifty, and... You know, that's their chocolate hit. But actually, chocolate is so much more subtle and nuanced than that. It's, you know, you can get everything from something that's really floral and fruity to something that's got like really dark tannins and really sort of malty flavours. And the difference is as huge as the difference between wines. So it's it's kind of trying to put that out to the world and say, actually, you don't just have to have this sweet, sugary confection you know, it's it's great as a snack. I'm not saying I never eat it either, because I do. But um, it's not what chocolate can be. So it's, you know, exploring the world of chocolate a little bit more. Yeah. Would you say that you've got quite a good palate for discerning the differences? I wouldn't have said so at the start. And... I think it's, again, like anything, if you have an interest in it and you practice it, you start to, you know, if you enjoy it, you start to spot the differences and start to feel how this one melts more um, smoothly in your mouth. That one might be slightly more granular. That would be to do with the grinding process. Um, And the same if you're a fan of wine, you'd go and you'd know that this one has a heavy tanning and this one's a much more fruity wine. You just kind of explore and look for new tastes and it gets quite exciting well if you're a geek like me it gets more exciting (laughs) so you know finding something new and tasting different things and it's lovely to go out there and see other bean to bar makers and what they're doing and um you know 
pinch ideas from them. That sounds mm -hmm. cheeky, but, you know, pinch ideas from them and uh, see how they do it differently. Oh, I love, I love that. So I know at this point people are going to be like, oh, my God, this sounds amazing. It's not just chocolate. And you have such a strong, unique U USP, I think, being vegan and kind of really diving into this world I just think yeah. that it's a bit like wine I think I think when you when you become drinking age you just kind of go alcohol <laughs> it's and like so the Lambrini comes out and <laughs> you start uh, with, the, with the accessible odds what's there and then it's when you start to explore a bit deeper you kind of go actually it's not just there to get me drunk or to give me a sugar hit it's yeah. there to be actually savoured and enjoyed and, you know, be something special rather than just that quick hit, which, to be honest, chocolate still is to most people, I think, that quick sugar hit. Yeah. Um, but it's starting to become a bit more of a movement where people are kind of like, no, I want, you know, talking to people. I was at a food festival on Sunday and talking to people who were like, oh, good chocolate. This bar is going to last me about a week. And I'm like, going wouldn't last me a week but never mind um but they will savor it and they'll have like a little square after dinner or something and it'll be special um instead of just ramming a mars bar down your face so it's it's a bit more of a movement i think of people starting to explore and enjoy chocolate a bit more than just shoving it in their face yeah yeah i, th I think it's almost like a decadence like a yeah, I, I have like lots of adject adjectives floating around my head, but I can't mm. kind of pick one. But it's very much like it is not just having a Mars bar ice cream after dinner or or having a, a little thing of like dairy milk or something like that. It is yeah. it is something that whilst you're eating it, it's, it's just, I suppose it's, it's along the same lines as like lint, isn't it? You're supposed to, I mean, you see the adverts, don't you, of the woman who's like, mm. Mm. <laughs> and she's having it savoring every morsel of it yes yeah and it's along those same lines right where it's not something that you just scarf down it, it is actually something that you sit and you're almost kind of taking a moment for yourself and you know I can just mm. imagine someone having a bar and having the journal out having a candle having a good movie and it's like That's it. yeah enjoying it and savoring it and having it for a special occasion kind of things and and yeah I think I get a lot of people who are like, well, yeah, I could just get that for £1.50 from Sainsbury's for a Kit Kat or whatever. But they're a completely different market. They're not the people that I aim at, you know, that those people who come and walk past my shop, my market and go into um, Savers or something. They're, they're not going to be the people who are going to be buying those chocolates. So it's just about targeting the right um, audience as well and appealing to that and I think if people are foodies if they're interested in where it comes from and the subtle differences in flavors they're the people who are going to engage yeah yeah so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask because I know that at this point people are gonna be like where can I find you where can I come and have a look so do you want to and I, I will ask you again at the end but <laughs> tell us where people can find you and kind of come over and have a little look at what you have yeah, the two main places are on Etsy. Um, so it's Rawson Chocolate, R-A-W-S-O-M-E Chocolate on Etsy. And I've also got my website, www.rawsomechocolate.co.uk. So they are the two main places. I'm based in the Midlands in Warwickshire. So I do quite a lot of markets around Coventry, Warwick, Leamington Spa, um, Stratford on Avon, that sort of area as well. So if there's a food festival on, I might be there. But mainly, yes, if you're looking to have a little browse, look on Etsy or look on my website. Love it. Awesome. Brilliant. Because I know, I just, I know, I know what people at this point will be like, oh, I really want to go and have a look. <laughs> so I just, I just thought I'd ask. So talking more about your journey now then, when did you, I guess, first come across me, Handmade Bosses? Like, how did that fit into where you're doing things? I was doing a lot of markets online, um, face to face markets and stuff. And it, with little people, um, in the house, it just became kind of unsustainable having to, you know, pack the car, sometimes take the babies with me as well and spend all day stood in front of a table trying to flog my stuff. 
Um, <laughs> and so I was looking at more online methods and I started off with a website, but I just found I wasn't that great at the marketing side of things. I'm on Instagram and I push it and push it as much as I can there. I put my wonky chocolates up this morning for the ones that have not worked in this heat. Um, <laughs> but it's um, it was just hard work to drive the traffic to my website. So I kind of was mooching around on YouTube and that's where I first came across you and binge watched about 20 um, <laughs> of your videos and kind of went, ah, this person knows what she's talking about. And you kind of had that similar, I was like, I can have a conversation with you. I think we'd be on a similar wavelength. And so I kind of opened my Etsy shop very tentatively. It was open for about a year with one product on it. And obviously didn't do anything, just sat there. And then I started to implement a few things that you talked about on YouTube. And it was like, okay, I'm getting sales now. And went from like a conversion rate of about 0.2 to now, since joining the HS, uh, HVSA, I have a conversion rate of about 5.4 consistently. Wow. So, you know, and I still don't have a huge number of products on there. I've probably got about 40 on there at the moment, mm. but it's growing. I mean, I'm about to put the advent calendar up which with 28 degrees temperatures outside, I'm thinking, who's even going to look at that? <laughs> but I, I received it this morning. Look, came in the post this morning. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. So, um, yeah, that was a weird one, actually, because I had a choice of about four different ones and thought, you know, pretty Christmas wreath, pretty snowy scene and all that sort of thing and put it on my Instagram and the quite plain Scandi looking one was the one that came out on top. And I was like, I just thought people have been more traditional. But um... I have a theory on that. And that is because yeah. is because so like my place is very like minimalist, very cream, yeah. wood, natural plant, like very boho. And when you get given like three to five different advent calendars that are all very brightly colored and it's like... It's it's they, a bit overwhelming. Yeah, they sit on my kitchen yeah. side and I'm like, I, I, I can't, it looks messy. So I think mm. that might be why it's like a aesthetically pleasing home decor slash advent calendar. Yes, yeah. So it's it's just kind of a, a greyish blue with white Scandi sort of Christmas trees on it. And it's, it's very plain almost. But um, to be honest, I chose it because it's similar to my brown colours, but I didn't think anybody else would. I just popped it up there and went, I'm quite like that one to win, but I don't think it's going to. And it's funny how things surprise you sometimes. That's really funny. But good, though. Mm-hmm. Easy. Good. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, that works because I like it too. But <laughs> if it had been one that I didn't like, I'd have been kind of a bit grudgy and filling it up going, mm, I don't like this one so much. But yeah. I'm yeah. happy now. <laughs> Love it. So you you mentioned the H- the HBSA around like kind of like what time in your timeline did you join? I joined last August, so it's about a year now. Um, so about three years into my journey, I'm a late comer to using it for um, for Etsy because, like I say, I'd opened my Etsy shop probably about a year or so earlier and just did naff all with it. <laughs> Um, and I've been, I've not been the best student, I'll say. I kind of do it in fits and spurts. So I'll have like a week of going, right, I'm going to do the entire target market module, which is enormous, by the way. Um, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) It's really useful, but it is, it's enormous. Make sure you put a bit of time away for that one. (laughs) But, um, I, I kind of sit down and kind of blast a module and go, okay. Now I've got that one. I'm going to kind of stick that in my head and work away at that for a couple of weeks. And then we'll go on to something new because I get a bit tunnel vision. And it's like, right, this is the thing. This is what I'm going to do. And I'd rather get that one thing right than do lots of things badly, if that makes sense. So it's, um, but it's, it's working. I'm, I'm kind of, I've just finished the brand module. So again, the Scandi blue works quite well with my brand, so that's that's worked out well. Because <laughs> um, it's interesting, because my target market is sort of 
young professionals and starting to be sort of restauranteurs. So it goes from sort of the young professionals are ten, tend to be more women in their 30s, I guess. And then the restaurateurs tend to be men in their 30s. So it's kind of finding that balance of brand that suits both styles of aesthetic. Yeah. And it's a bit bit of a weird crossover. So um so I think the Scandi Blue is working quite well. It's you know I agree, yeah. Not too floral, not too floral and um putting off the male customers, but it's <laughs> still that clean, pretty aesthetic for the female customers. Brilliant. Yeah, I like <laughs> I like that. I like I, I always think blue is a very kind of like in the middle colour. Um mm. And whenever I do polls and things about what's your favourite colour, blue always comes out on top, which is fine because it's my favourite colour as well. So, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> <That's just known. laughs> yeah. So, what impact then would you say the course has had on your journey, on your business? Like, tell us more a little bit about that. It's given me focus, really. That's what it's really done. It's given me focus and direction. Um, because I was throwing spaghetti at the wall to steal phrase. And it was just, yeah, not knowing what to do in what order and sort of sitting down and doing the HBSA and working through that first module, The um, it, it just kind of was like, oh, yes, I can do this. I It's not going to be crazy. It's not going to be trying to do a million things at once and I know I've still got a long long way to go but I know I've got a structure to follow to get there so it's it's been really good in that respect and I I mean like I say I'm only part way through the second module um the second part of it but the difference to my shop is amazing it's like I say gone from virtually no conversion rate at all to like a 5% conversion rate, which I understand is quite a good conversion rate. I need to get more people into the shop in the first place, and that's pushing, you know, other areas. But where I am at the moment, I know that it's ticking over, and I will soon be able to say, this is my full-time job, which is brilliant. Yeah, and I know what I can do to make it even better. I just need to be disciplined and do it. (laughs) (laughs) Brilliant. That is, that is fab. And what and what impact would you say like your business, the course, like the whole thing wrapped up has had on your life? I used to be a full time teacher, and before I had the twins, I was an assistant head in a very big inner city school, working every hour under the sun because I was in charge of so many different departments and so on, and. It's kind of been a combination of having the twins and and starting HBSA. Have kind of the twins were the catalyst for me making a change, and HBSA has been the the way that I've been able to be successful at it. Mm. So now I my my daughter has cerebral palsy, so I wasn't able to go back to teaching. Certainly not the hours I was. I could be there until seven eight o'clock some nights. Mm. Um, but I can now work from home and work around the kids. And yes, I seem to be the worst boss I've ever had, paying my, you know, at least at the beginning, paying myself less than minimum wage and working a ridiculous number of hours. But I could do those hours when they were asleep. I wouldn't have to be out of the house to do it. And so it just means that family life is a lot more easy. Um, And... We're just basically working as a family now instead of it being, oh, sorry, mummy's got to drop everything and rush off because there's something going on that needs her attention. I can I can be there and do that because, I mean, even when they first started nursery, I was still doing the teaching and it was, you know, poor little things would be chucked into nursery at eight o'clock in the morning and picked up at six. And I had kids to spend time with them, not to give them to somebody else to look after. Mm. So now it's so much nicer being able to do the drop-offs and do the pickups and at school and be able to go to sports day and things like that because, okay, the work still needs to be done, but it's done on my terms when I'm, I'm able to do it rather than it being to somebody else's schedule. And that is just a revelation, really. 
Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I feel I feel that I do. I think that it's yeah. I think most people um, when they start a business, it's not. It's not necessary the money side. I mean, the money side is great. I mean, we all need need money, but... Oh, yes, yeah, so it'd be nice if I could, uh, you know, retire early as well. But <laughs> actually, I enjoy working too, so I don't know what I'd do if I did, so... It's 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 true, and it's and it's not just it's not just that. I just think it's 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 having the time, ha- having your time back. My husband has just kind of switched jobs, and he's gone from he you know his entire working life, been working since he's like fourteen years old, and it's always been nine, well, not even that, eight till five or eight till six or something, yeah. something like that. And he's only just made the change to a job where he can work three to four days a week at home. And the difference, the difference is insane. And and even just that little change, you think, wow, yeah, like that goes that goes a long way because you can have mm. coffee when you want. You can use the loo when you, <laughs> when you oh, want. Oh, using the toilet when I want is a revelation. It's like when you're in a classroom with 30 children, you can't just go, sorry, kids, look after yourselves whilst I nip out. Oh, so oh it's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, because I taught little ones as well, sort of, but, um, four to seven year olds so it's like yes I don't think I can trust 30 of you to have the classroom still standing if I nip out for five minutes oh god it's, um, it's, it's a massive deal it really really is I mean yeah when you've got you know kids or pets or family members or even just having a social life you're like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're like well I can go and see a movie at three o'clock on a when a Wednesday oh. or I can go for lunch on my own you know what I mean it, it's, it's really so nice yeah it's a massive deal it really really is um so much more I think deeper meaning than just I'm in it to make a ridiculous amount which will come mm. but as a, there, there's a lot of like tail end things that I don't think enough people know about when they first start I actually think as well it's 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 really not about making huge it would be lovely to replace my teacher wage and I haven't done that yet but to be honest it's the lifestyle difference that's the most important it's yeah being comfortable enough off that I can you know just go for a coffee with with some friends on a, you know straight after drop off in the morning and not have to be rushing constantly and that stress level of constantly rushing and constantly meeting other people's targets is just oh so nice not to have to do that yeah yeah I obviously like working in a kind of high-end high street jewelers it was like mm. targets, targets 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 and it yeah it was it was it was a lot it, it was just you know and if you hit the targets, the targets would get higher. <laughs> and then you'd be like, yes, so well, you can never win. <laughs> you can never win. No, I know. Anyway, anyway, we all, we all know it's hard. It's hard out there, right? And I think just having something, not only that's yours, but, but also it being a creative thing. It's good for your heart. It's good for your soul. It's good for your mental health. And it's good for your bank balance as well, because you can work as hard or as little as you like. You know? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know that if I put up, you know, sounds a bit flippant and it's not as easy as it was sort of back at the tail end of COVID. It's not put up a post on Instagram and you get a sale from it instantly. You've got to plug away at it. But I know that if I put in that little bit of effort and people see, like, for example, I've got a load of wonky chocolates, I'm calling them, because they didn't quite come out of the mould right because it's been a bit hot. So stick them on Instagram and with a 40% off what they would normally cost and they've gone and they're perfectly lovely chocolates, really nice and tasty still, but they're not look looking as beautiful as I would like them to. Yeah. Um, and do you know what? I probably would have just put them in the bin before, which sounds terrible, but somebody loves them. Somebody wants them. And I've, I've paid for the costs of what it, it costs to make them so that's you know a bonus love that so, love that yeah. yeah yeah I'm a massive fan of that so I want to ask you then how different is your business between a year ago versus now totally different mm-hmm. um a year ago it was I'll call it an expensive hobby <laughs> um <Yeah. laughs> 
my husband was starting, are you still messing around with this chocolate stuff? Is that, oh, yes. Um, and it was hard work as well. I mean, no, I was coming off the tail end of COVID when everything was just selling online very easily. Mm-hmm. And so I had that little sort of honeymoon period at the beginning. And then it just kind of a year or so ago, ago declined and became hard and became a slog. And I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, I was, you know, watching things online and going, I'll try this and then doing something else and try that. And you'd see things and be flitting from one thing to the other. And it just didn't gel. And last August, I, I got HBSA and it was a path to follow. And it was like, right, OK, blinkers on. I'm not looking at all these other things anymore. And I followed that and it didn't happen overnight and it's, you know, still quite a long way to go. But I could see that the changes I was making were effective rather than going, oh, I'll try this and leave it for a week and that hasn't worked and do this for a week and that hasn't worked. And, you know, nothing works in a week anyway. You've got to keep going at it. But with a path to follow and knowing I'm going to set that and leave it, I'm going to do it get it working, leave it, see what happens, and then try the next thing, get that going, tweak that a bit. That hasn't worked. You know, having a plan to follow, it makes it so much more sensible and, you know, for your own sanity, it's you don't feel like you're rushing around like a headless chicken doing all the things. It's just a lot more focused and a lot more straightforward. So, yeah, now I am making... Probably, even in this hot weather, I'm still doing two or three sales a day of chocolate, which people are mad. I don't know why, but people are still buying. Um, I'm not posting when it's over 28 degrees, but um, they know that. So it's uh, it's still still going well. And then hopefully around Christmas time, around September onwards, I will be able to say, yes, I am earning the equivalent to my teacher wage, which would be amazing. That's so cool. That's so cool. Well done you. Cause I, cause I know that you've been on like the coaching calls, you've been in the course, like you've been yeah. in it, you've been staying in the room and that is awesome to see that although mm. you're like plugging away, albeit like slowly, 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 I think even, even just getting in, I mean, I know the target market module is, is quite early on in phase two, but even, even that yeah. it's making it's a difference. It's making a huge difference because the target market module feeds into all the other modules afterwards. So, I mean, I know I've seen on your coaching calls and things, a lot of people have gone, oh, it's too much. I can't cope and I'm going to skip over that one. Go back to it because without it, you're not making targeted decisions when you do your branding, for example, or when you do other things, what you're marketing towards. You need to do that um target market one and it is it's blooming hard work Steph and <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> but it's, it's definitely worth doing um and yeah it probably took me about a month you know do, just doing a little bit every couple of days probably took me about a month to kind of get through that particular bit but now that I have done it it's like light bulbs going off going oh, that's why that bit of my branding fell flat on its face. So that's why, you know, when I marketed it this way, I had two likes on Instagram. It's because it wasn't to my people. So, you know, it just makes so much more sense. Yeah. And even like halfway through this, you were like, this is my target market. They are this, they are that. I know that my products have to be housed in colors that are more so like this. I know my brand, like you could just reel all of, all of that off and it's backed Mm. up by all of the work that you've done. And it's also backed up by, by the fact that people are liking it. They're buying it. They are commenting on it. You know, there's a, Mm. I think that when you're trying to just sort of wing it and, and, and try and test and try and test that can take even longer. Oh, it's exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't really know. If it's actually working, if what, you know, if you're trying too many things in a bit of a scattergram way, do you really know what is working? It's just like, I had a reel that went viral, amazing, but the next five or 10 
still do nothing at all because actually I can't pinpoint what was so amazing about that particular one in relation to my customers. So yeah. it's, 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 yeah, having a method to follow, it just, it means that I know that what I'm doing is being effective rather than it just being luck. Yeah. So it, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you see yourself and your business in a year's time? Oh, big question. Um, in an ideal world, I would like to move out of my kitchen because <laughs> chocolate making is a bit of a noisy business. And so if I can continue to grow in the way that I am, in a year's time, I would be looking at getting a unit perhaps that I can convert into a chocolate kitchen. And that it that opens the doors to other things like running local workshops for people, getting people in for tasting evenings. And, you know, it's just another avenue to kind of explore on top of the website and on top of Etsy and on top of Instagram that will bring more of a local custom in. And it also means I can expand in terms of my production because at the moment I'm limited to my little kitchen downstairs with, um, you know, I can't have the machines running during the summer holidays when people are at home, all the kids are home and it is noisy. So I have to limit it to overnight running the machines, which is not ideal. And so it would just mean that, you know, if I can keep building in the way that I am, I reckon in about a year's time, well, I'm in my ideal little bubble in my head over this summer period when it is quieter and when it is more difficult to produce, I can be setting up my kitchen and getting that ready for the Christmas season. And that is that is my little fingers crossed plan. Oh, I love that. That is great. That is awesome. That sounds like a really exciting plan. Mm. <laughs> um, ask me again in a year. Yeah. You'll be like, oh, I need I need a team now. I can't, <laughs> I can't do it all by myself anymore. <laughs> well, that's that's the dream. <laughs> yeah. Um what piece of advice would you give to yourself a year ago? Keep going and trust the process because there were so many times when I nearly stopped. I mean, like I say, I was doing a lot of markets and that was exhausting going all over, you know, up to Nottingham, down to Oxford, over to Birmingham, all over the place with little children in tow. And it was at about that time, I kind of decided this is it. I've got to focus on the online side of things and didn't really, you know, I'd been watching your YouTube videos and I'd been doing little bits and bobs, but I didn't really know what I was doing a year ago. It was that point that I bought HBSA that I was like, focus. And yeah, my advice would be buy HBSA focus on it and trust the process so I'm plugging you for you there <laughs> but, but honestly that was kind of like the you know it was working going to the markets I was earning a living from it but it was exhausting with two little people to drive around the country and switching to more of an online focus was just like oh I now have a life back. I've got my weekends again. And it's been, you know, I still do maybe one a month, but I'm not doing it every weekend, two days every weekend. And it's it's lovely to have that bit of freedom and to be able to spend time with my children that isn't, you know, don't knock over the display, please. You know, it's it's just so much nicer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love I love that. And my last question, which is always a funny one, is what crazy but true fact is there about you i was once a dead body <laughs> on a tv show <laughs> no way okay explain explain um i was about 16 and a casting director came to my school looking for somebody to play a character um in a touch of frost that shows my age now <laughs> yeah no no i know i know <laughs> and so i met david jason who was lovely and very short and um and I lay on the side of a canal pretending to be dead. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> your claim to stardom might have been a little, little bit different, but <laughs> I love that. That is great. Rock and roll lifestyle, hey? 
<laughs> well, you must have done a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't ask me back. <laughs> oh. oh, well. <laughs> I don't think I lay still enough. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, so again, I'm going to ask you to like plug, 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 tell people where they where they can find you, anything you're doing that you want to draw attention to, any freebies, email list, go for it. Yeah, well, my um, website is www.rawsomechocolate.co.uk. That's R-A-W-S-O-M-E chocolate. Sign up to my mailing list on there and you'll get a bit of money off when you make your first purchase. And I'm also on Etsy, so that is Rawsome Chocolate on Etsy, which is probably my main selling point, my main um, successful marketplace at the moment. I do markets around the Midlands, and so if you follow me on Instagram, um, I always put up where I'm going to be next. Um, I don't have anything until the 28th of September now. I'm in Nottingham um, at St Mary's Church. And that will be the start of sort of the launch of the Christmas stuff, really. In September, that seems mad. So that will be my next market. But I'm on Instagram as Rawson Chocolate UK. So that is me. Brilliant. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, definitely everyone listening, watching, go and check out Vicky's stuff because it is so, so lovely. And the packaging is nice. Everything is just so, so cool. So oh, definitely go and have a little look and buy as well for not not only your vegan friends, but also everyone who wants to be a better chocolate eater. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much. It's been really, really cool to like learn, learn about the process and everything that goes into it. So well done you, but it's been lovely getting to know you and like chatting and yeah. Oh, thanks, Steph. Lovely to talk to you. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for listening, watching, wherever you're consuming this. And we will speak soon. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to How to Be a Handmade Boss. And if you're eager to boost your Etsy sales within just seven days, then be sure to join my most popular free training at handmadebosses.com forward slash conversion. You can also find the link in the show notes as well. Keep an eye out for our next episode where we'll be continuing our journey towards handmade business success together. And until then, keep crafting and stay inspired because the world really does need those special creations that only you can make.